Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, tonight's guest, as you probably already know, is a best-selling author. Has about over 30 books, sold over 25 million copies in over 40 countries, and was and her novels were the inspiration and for the Brazilian Isles TV series. And uh, she is a New Englander amongst us for over two decades now and was kind enough to come down tonight to North Reading. So without further ado, please welcome Tess Harrison. pretty loud, but I guess I'll just step back a little bit. It's great to be here, and uh, thank you for the chance that I don't think I've ever been in North Reading. So it's really wonderful to be here tonight, and I, um, how many of you heard uh, WBUR this afternoon? Anybody hear that? Okay, one person. So I can go ahead and tell the stories that I told on the radio this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, first of all, about, I'm going to answer some questions that I know people already want to know because I've heard them again and again. Um, the first one is, why do you write the kinds of books you write? What is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, those sort of twisted stories. What kind of a person does that? Um, and uh, it's my mother's fault. And, uh, seriously, it's my mother's fault. My mother was an immigrant from China. She didn't understand English very well, but what she did enjoy and she did understand was the American horror film. Uh, because it's very visual. So she took my brother and made every scary movie that Hollywood had. I grew up in a golden age of horror films, uh, and I learned from that uh, that the height of entertainment was to scare your audience. And I think I always fall back on that. It's, it's, it's childhood love of being afraid in a dark theater. But the other thing I think that really affected me was uh, when I was young, I, had, I was, um, I was <clears throat> exposed to a homicide case. We had a beloved family friend, uh, I'll just call him Uncle Mike. Um, he, was, uh, he was somebody I really trusted and believed in, and um, he was like a second father to me, because my dad was always working. Uh, and when I turned 18, um, Uncle Mike was arrested for torturing and murdering his sister-in-law. Oh. Um, he drowned her in the toilet. Oh. And um, I, you know, I just never saw that. I never saw that coming. I never imagined he would do anything like that. It was something that remained and still remains a mystery to me to this day. And I think that every novel I write is all about trying to understand what makes people do this. Trying to, trying to solve the mystery of Uncle Mike. And I know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's the kind of thing that we're all fascinated by and troubled by with somebody who seems ordinary and seems perfectly kind. Um, actually, it turns out to be hiding something dark and monstrous inside them. Um, so my books, in, in a sense, are just repeatedly trying to answer that question. Um, now, the other question that people always want to know about why do you write these kinds of stories is where do you get these ideas from? You know, because some of these ideas are pretty grotesque. Um, and the truth is, it's not necessarily me. <laughs> it's I, I am channeling uh, things that I have read or seen or heard about in conversation. Um, these are things that are not necessarily from my own dark places, but because of the fact that I'm fascinated by um, dark things. Um, so as an example, uh, I get a lot of ideas from true crime. Uh, I get a lot of premises uh, from reading the newspapers, or watching the news, or reading People magazine, or uh, the National Enquirer, that's a really good one. <laughs> so here's an article that I read in the Boston Globe. It was about uh, something that happened in the suburbs. It was uh, a young woman who was found dead in her bathtub with empty pill bottles nearby. It was clearly an overdose. So the police didn't see a crime here, and they took her into a body bag and sent her to the morgue. And a couple of hours later, she woke up. Oh. Um, and she, she ended up going home. She was fine. She recovered and she was perfectly okay. Um, but as a human being, you're thinking, how often does this happen? Oh my God, this is horrifying. Because we all had that same reaction. <gasps> what if I woke up in a body bag? Um, or even worse, what if I woke up, you know, in a cemetery? So I did a search online for mistaken for dead. I wanted to find out how often does this happen? 
And I found a number of cases from just that one year. There was a kid whose uh, death certificate had been signed, and the nurse realized he was still breathing. There was uh, a man hit by a car in Atlanta, spent the night in the morgue refrigerator, and somebody heard him moving. Um, I have, my literary agent grew up um, on Nantucket, and when I told her these stories, she said, oh, Nantucket, that used to happen all the time. <laughs> And the reason for it is when she was young, she said they had a nursing home, and the medical director, you know, the doctor who's responsible for declaring you dead, was deaf. So they would call him up to examine Mrs. Smith, and he put his stethoscope on the heart, and he wouldn't hear it. So Mrs. Smith went off to the, to, the, to the local morgue. And in one year, three people woke up. Uh, and so the local Nantuckians, or whatever you call them, <laughs> said uh, they called their, their local morgue the House of Rejuvenation. <laughs> but the most, I think the most upsetting story I heard was something I read about in the 1970s. It was New York City. There was a man who was about to be autopsy. He was lying on the autopsy table, and uh, the doctor was about to cut him open, and the man woke up. Uh, the doctor was so scared, he was so startled, he had a heart attack. Oh, oh, and, oh, uh, and unless you think that's, that's the only time that's happened, there's another story that I saw. This was in the National Enquirer, so I know it's true. <laughs> a man in Brazil was actually cut open, and the doctor saw that the heart was still beating. And um, he sent the man straight to the hospital, and he, he survived. And he, uh, there was a photo of him, I remember, in the Enquirer, with his shirt open, showing his autopsy scar, a young man. So anyway, this, these are the kinds of stories that fascinate me, because they probably fascinate you as well, right? I mean, you saw that, and you would want to read more about it. It's because we are, we are interested in things that not only scare us, but things that make us go, how the heck did that happen? Um, so um, first I'm focused on the curiosity, but then the writer, the writer aspect comes in. The writer's always thinking, how do I turn this into a book? Um, so the idea of a corpse waking up in the morgue, isn't that a great opening for a book? <laughs> you know, okay. So what, where is the story? What kind of a story are you going to write with this fantastic opening? <coughs> now, if I were a horror novelist, I might start that off as about, it's the beginning of a zombie novel. You know, corpse wakes up. Uh, or I would say, uh, this is the... <laughs> This is a vampire that uh, unfortunately ended up in the wrong place, and now he's awake. Um, if I were to write spy novels, I would say this is my hero spy, he's faked his death, and this is how he's going to escape. Um, but I did it um, using my characters, Rizzoli and Isles. Uh, in my book, Vanish, Maura Isles is working late in the morgue one night. She hears a noise, she opens up the body bag, and lo and behold, the corpse's eyes pop open. So she sends, uh, she calls 911, this, this uh, young woman who's now alive is sent to the um, emergency room, and there she does something nobody expects. She grabs the security guard's gun, she kills him, and she takes hostages. And among the hostages she takes in this hospital is a very, very pregnant homicide detective who's Water is broken, she's in active labor, she's got a little hospital gown on, so nobody knows she's a cop, and she's afraid she's about to get killed by this crazy woman. So anyway, that, that is how uh, <coughs> Jane Rizzoli had the very worst labor of delivery. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that's you know, what you, you, you just pay attention to these, to these incredible things that happen all around you, these, these stories. Um, sometimes I get ideas. Um, from uh, interests. I mean, I think writers tend to have a large array of hobbies and interests and curiosities. Um, I was, in before I went to medical school, <coughs> I had an undergraduate degree in anthropology. So I've always been interested in other cultures, but I was specifically interested in Egyptology and Egyptian mummies. And, you know, there, it's fascinating that we have in this country about 400 to 500 Egyptian mummies. So I have been corresponding, um, out of curiosity, with an Egyptologist who has an organization called the Mummy Consortium. And his organization is all about trying to make sure that every Egyptian mummy in the U.S. gets a CAT scan. That's the one way you can, you can study a mummy without damaging it. So um, he, may, he arranges these CAT scans around the country, and he called one day and said, we're about to do one. You want to come and watch? I drove down to the Poughkeepsie. 
uh, helped them move the mummy from the local museum, put it in the white van, we drove it to the local hospital. Because mummies are scanned on the same machines that you and I are scanned on in hospitals. Um, and as they're about to put this mummy on, the, they're putting the mummy on the CAT scan, and as a writer, I'm always listening to conversation that I might be able to use in a book someday. And I was hearing something that was kind of made me laugh, because I found out that it had taken months to arrange this CAT scan. The doctors wanted to do it, the museum wanted to do it, the, the x-ray department couldn't wait to do it, but what held it up for months was a hospital lawyer. A hospital lawyer said, we are required to abide by HIPAA rules in this country, and HIPAA rules demand patient confidentiality. Uh, plus, this patient cannot sign a consent form. Uh, so the museum signed it as the, pair, as the patient's parents. Uh, and we, and the, they started, they, they tried to start the program to get the CAT scan, that's ridiculous, right? <laughs> Try to get the CAT scan started, and before you can get the, the program started, you need patient information. Um, and so, first of all, what is the patient's age? <laughs> and the museum said about 2,000 years old. <laughs> so they tried that, it wouldn't work. So they put in a day old, and then they wanted the, the patient's sex. And, he's, and I'm a doctor, and I did not know that these CAT scan programs allow three choices for sex. Male, female, and other. Um, and since they had never used other before, they put this patient in as an other. So it was a it was a it was a one day old other, and they're watching the CAT scans, and you know CAT scans are like cross sections of the body, you're just seeing X rays, um, and we could see that there the brain was not there; it had been evacuated by whoever you know the ancient Egyptians who had who had mummified this person. And if you ever wonder how they do how they get that brain out, there's really only one hole that's punched through the nose. They get that brain out through the nose. Um, they used to think Herodotus used, uh, described that they would stick up. Uh, a hook up there and hook the brain and pull it out, um, but that's not true, because Egyptologists have tried to do that uh, with cadavers, and they found out that the only way to get that brain out through that one hole in the nose was to introduce kind of a whisk-like instrument and blend it in place to liquefy it, and that's how the brain was evacuated. Um, and you get down to the bot, through the rest of the, of the torso, and you see that the organs have been removed and dried and wrapped in linen. Um, and we got down to the thigh bone and saw a really interesting thing there. Uh, the femur had been, had been fractured. Uh, and there was no sign of healing, so I thought, oh, that, that must be the cause of death. He fell off a horse or something and broke his leg and bled to death. Uh, but I'm also thinking, and, and I never stop thinking the way a writer thinks, which is I'm, I'm always thinking about what kind of a cool twist could I put to this scene. And the twist I was imagining was, what if we saw something that nobody could explain and nobody would expect? Deep in the muscle of this 2,000-year-old mummy that looks at, completely intact on the outside, what if deep in the muscle we saw a bullet? Think about that. <laughs> Not 2,000 years old, is it? So um, that's that's how that became the, uh, the the premise for my novel, The Keepsake, which is Mora is watching a, a cat scan of a mummy that is supposedly 2,000 years old, uh, sees a bullet, and uh, calls up Jane Rizzoli and says, if "We have a homicide case here, and it appears to be a modern homicide case that has been mummified." Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's an example of how you use your interest, you use your curiosity, and even though I was an, an anthropology major, you know, ages ago, it took decades for me to figure out what the story would be that I would use my interest in. Um, sometimes I get ideas from travel, and my husband is not here, so I can tell you the story. <laughs> this is a story, we, were, we went on safari uh, a couple years ago. And if any of you have been on safari, you know that they tell you to stay in the jeep, right? So you can, you know, you drive around and there are all these animals, all these leopards and, 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 and lions and elephants. And as long as you stay in the jeep, they don't attack you because they somehow imagine that everything in that jeep is one large animal. And it's amazing to me that that's true, but um, they just don't jump into jeeps and attack you. So we always learn to stay in the jeep. But every afternoon at sunset, there is this wonderful, um, this, this, uh, they have cocktails at sunset. And they find a nice, uh, a nice clearing, and they get out, you get out of the Jeep, and you have your cocktail. And so that afternoon, we did. 
Um, and my husband said, oh, no, really, I have to pee. Can I go in those bushes over there? And our ranger, our ranger, the guy who's you know in charge of keeping us safe, he said, you know, why don't you go in those bushes behind us? Because I heard radio chatter that somebody had seen a leopard down that valley over there. So my husband goes off to the other bushes. And in the meantime, we're all out of the Jeep, drinking our, our gins and tonic, gin and tonics. And about 10, 15 seconds after my husband disappeared into the bushes over there, out of the bushes he had originally been heading for, out walked a leopard. Oh, wow. And that, we're all out of the Jeep. <laughs> we're standing there with our drinks and think, what do we do now? And our ranger just, he yelled, everybody freeze. And he walked between us and the leopard. And he stood there. He's a big Afrikaans guy, big blonde guy. He just stood there like this. He didn't even reach for his rifle. He just stood there and he stared that leopard at that leopard. And the leopard looked at him and turned around and walked back into the bush. And then we all jumped into the jeep. Um, so anyway, uh, I, you know, later on that evening, we were just sitting around getting another drink because we needed it. And talking about how this, this ranger, this man, had kept us alive. He had, you know, he had saved us. And I, I told my husband, he saved you in particular <laughs> from the ignominious death of dying with your fly open. <laughs> you know that's what would have happened. He right? would have got there, he would have got his fly open, and that leopard would have, would have gotten it. So anyway, I, 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 you know, this, this experience was, it was, it was um, adventurous and scary. But in the end, the first thing I thought was, wow, it's dangerous out here. Um, and the only person who kept us alive was this one person that we were forced, we had to trust, we had to put our lives in, in his hands. And then the writer thinks, oh, what if we shouldn't really be trusting him? What if it turns out he's the last person we should trust, and actually the most dangerous creature in the bush walks on two legs and not four? And so that became a story of Die Again, about a, a group of tourists who go on safari, and they don't come back. <laughs> Except for one person who may be the sole witness to what may have gone wrong. Um, and then a couple of years later, um, it becomes a, hooked on to a, a homicide in Boston. And that's where Jane and Maura step into, this, into the picture because they realize that this is, there's a connection between the crimes they're seeing now and that, that doomed safari party that, that all died a couple, a couple of years ago. So um, that's an example of where travel can, uh, you know, just being in a foreign place, experiencing you and different things can, can waken up this, this creative spark that makes you think, oh, there's a story here. Um, and now I come to my current book, which I was really should be talking about, um, and that is a, another book that was inspired by travel. I was um, in Italy on holiday, and like most good tourists, I was visiting a lot of art museums, and I was looking at a lot of, of art, religious art, um, Renaissance art, and I was getting really bored, because you see the same subjects in all these old churches and all these old museums again and again. You see the Madonna and Child, a hundred virgins of the Madonna and Child. Uh, you see a lot of saints, you see a lot of the same faces, and I thought, why, why do I keep dragging myself from museum to see the same faces again and again? Uh, but then I bought this book, called How to Read a Painting. Now I'm not, I have no real, you know, I have no background in art history. So I, I bought this book, How to Read a Painting, and it opened my eyes to the fact that there are, there are little Easter eggs, there are little symbols in this, this medieval, medieval art that tell you more about these stories than you're, you're even aware of. Um, for instance, they talked about some of the symbols. If you see a, a person standing, holding a palm frond, that means something. That palm frond is a symbol of, of martyrdom. So that person died a Christian martyr. Um, if you see a little white dove anywhere in the painting, that is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. If you see a Madonna and child, and then you just look around, anywhere in there is a human skull, that skull represents Adam. 
Um, so there are all these symbols, and in particular, I got fascinated by the symbols of the saints, because the martyred saints died really horrible deaths. I mean, now, those of you who are Catholic, you probably know all the horrible ways that the saints that became, became saints. Um, and the, the symbols of how they died are in these paintings. You don't even need to read who they are. You know who they are based on what you're seeing. Um, a woman standing with a broken wheel. Does anybody know who that is? That's, that's a, oh yeah, okay, we have, we have somebody back there. It's St. Catherine. Right, Catherine of Siena. She died tortured on the wheel. Um, if you see a man uh, with arrows shot in his, in his chest, I mean, I don't know how many of you know that that's St. Sebastian, a Roman soldier who refused to give up um, worshiping the old Roman gods, and so he was executed. First they shot arrows into him, but he didn't die. So they had to take off his head. Um, and um, there is a St. Saint, Saint Agatha. This one kind of freaks me out. You see a woman with a tray that looks like she's holding bread loaves, two bread loaves. They aren't bread loaves. They're the breasts that were cut off of her when she was, when she was tortured. So, I mean, I'm looking at this history of the saints, I'm going, wow, uh, those Catholic kids, they really learned a lot. <laughs> number one, and, and number two, I thought, now when I, when I would look at a painting in a church and I would see a woman holding what looked like red loaves, it became not just a pretty, you know, thing, it became, oh my God, that's horrible, that's her. Um, so I, I started to look at art with new eyes. I started to look at it um, almost like a treasure hunt. You'd see a new painting, and you'd look, and you'd search that painting, and you'd find the little things that told you something extra. And then the writer comes into the picture. And the writer come, that comes into the picture, unfortunately, is me. And I'm thinking, oh, what, what if the killer did that? What if the killer used a crime scene the way a painter uses a painting? and puts in clues, puts in symbols that are meant to convey a message. Now, we don't know who this message is meant for, and we're not even sure we understand what the message is meaning, but to him it means something. Um, and so the book opens up with um, Jane and Mora with a, a very strange death scene. It's a young woman who uh, is, was a horror, an independent horror film pro uh, producer. She's lying in bed looking very peaceful. Um, and you might think she's asleep, except for the fact she's holding her eyeballs in her hand. Oh. And those of you who are familiar with that would know which saint I'm talking about. Um, but see, that Jane and Mora aren't thinking about that. They're thinking that we have a weirdo on our hands. Um, but what really bothers Mora is that she cannot figure out how this woman died. Because the, this was all post-mortem, you know, the eyeballs being removed was all post-mortem. How do they kill this woman? She looks perfectly healthy otherwise. And she, she encounters a similar situation uh, at a different crime scene of a young man with arrows in his chest, but the arrows were all poked in post-mortem. How are these people getting killed? And that's, that's really the central mystery for Mora. And if you know Mora, this drives her crazy. She can't answer this question. So that's, that's part of, of what uh, inspired it, is that trip to Italy. Um, but there's another part that inspired it. Um, and this actually is something that I, I had had in my clippings file for oh, a couple decades. You know, whenever I see something that, that I think is going to be part of a story, I just, I just rip it out of the magazine, and I put it in a folder, and I leave it there. And sometimes it takes decades for me to figure out how to use this piece of information. Now, this piece of information came from the late 1980s to early 90s, and it, it was of interest to me because it happened in my hometown of San Diego. Uh, there was a, a man named Dale Akiki. He was born with a, a congenital abnormality so that his face looked a little funny. He did not look you know, like, like every other human being. He was a sort of an object of curiosity, but he was said to be a very kind and sweet individual who was a, a devout churchgoer, um, was a, an active member of his church, and, and taught Sunday school. So while the parents were there having their service right down the hall, Mr. Kiki was, was taking care of the children who were about three and four years old. He had a whole classroom there. And he was a, the Sunday school teacher for a couple of years. The kids all adored him, and everything was fine until one of the mothers called the police and said, I think Mr. Kiki has sexually molested my son. And the police went about this the wrong way. They wrote letters to all the other parents and said, we believe Mr. Kiki may be molesting children. Uh, talk to your kids and find out if you, if any of them have had problems. 
So, of course, the parents would talk to their little three-year-olds and say, did he do this to you? Did he do that to you? And, of course, some of these kids will say, sure. You know, after a while, they keep getting asked the same questions, and then they start to be agreeable. Um, so he went to prison uh, waiting, awaiting trial for, I think, 20 months. Um, and in the end, because the jury was able to see the, um, uh, the questioning of the children on videotape, they acquitted him because of the stories that the kids were telling during the questioning. The stories the kids told were not, not necessarily that they were molested. The stories, and they were very convinced these happened, Mr. Akiki took us out on a boat and killed a shark. Mr. Akiki killed a baby in the classroom and flushed it down the toilet. Mr. Kiki killed a giraffe. Um, this was, this was the, the litany of stories that these children were telling, and, and yet the prosecution went to trial. It was the longest trial in San Diego history. And the first people that knew he was innocent, interestingly enough, were his fellow inmates. When he was brought to, when he was brought to jail, prison, the other prisoners said, ah, oh, he didn't do it. And they protected him for that entire time he was in jail. All the fellow prisoners banded together and made sure he was safe. And when he finally went home, um, he, was, he went home in a stretch limousine paid for by the police because they also realized very soon that this was a very strange case. Um, and only after the trial was over did they understand that the original accuser, the original mother, was schizophrenic. So that was a case that um, was one of these, you know, luckily he was acquitted and he went home and he was able to go on with his life. Um, but there's this, this same story was happening around the country in the late 80s. And it, it actually was happening so in so many places and was such a strange phenomenon, it got a, a name. It was called the, the Satanic Ritual Abuse Panic. And it overtook the United States and Australia and Europe, and it all happened within a, a period of about 10 years, in which psychologists were being told that we had satanic ritual abuse going on all around us. Now, when I moved to Maine about 30 years ago, 27 years ago, I, I talked to a psychologist, and she said that, she, that we are unaware of all the satanists that are around us, all around us, and the only reason we haven't found out about it yet is we haven't discovered all the dead babies they killed. Um, so there was, I mean, there have been multiple cases. There was another trial. How many of you remember the McMartin Preschool trial? Oh, yeah. um, yes, it was a whole family that were that was that was thrown in jail along with the, their the people they had hired. It was a preschool, and they were eventually acquitted after I think it must have been five years. It was the longest trial in the United States history. But again, it was um, the kids were telling stories like um, oh Raymond flew around the room on a broom. Um, and you know, and he you know, he killed babies. This was a, a sort of a continuing thing. He killed babies and flushed them down the toilet into a secret room. And of course, nobody ever found dead babies. Um, but they were eventually acquitted, but not until they had spent years in prison. So I was fascinated by this whole thing. And, and by the by the early '90s, the whole thing had died away, and you just didn't hear about satanic ritual abuse anymore. It was just this one thing that was a phenomenon that was happening in this decade. Um, and I was, I was fascinated by not only the prosecution of things that clearly could not have happened, um, but also the fact that these children really believed it happened to them. I mean, these, these kids were convinced, and some of them, until they were adults and realized it couldn't have happened, uh, grew up thinking that they were abused. So what is it about memory that, that convinces us that these things that never happened really happened? Well, um, there's something called false memory syndrome. And I want to bring that up because I'm a victim of it myself. Remember I told you about uncle, my, my uncle that, that murdered his sister-in-law. Um, I had a decades of memories that the day he murdered her, he came to our house um, and he seemed perfectly ordinary, very happy, and he brought us cookies and he said hi to my mother. And I remember vividly every detail of that visit, the day that he actually killed her. Um, and then I was asked to do an article about it uh, about 10 years ago. And I went into the archives of the San Diego Union Tribune to, um, to look at the trial. And I realized something that startled me, which was the day he <coughs> murdered her, I could not have been home to have witnessed what happened. And I could not have been there to see him come over to visit. Because I was 300 miles away on a college campus. I was my freshman year. I was not there. So why did I remember that visit. 
It was because for years my mother had talked about it. My mother had told me about the day he came to visit and he brought cookies and, and he just seemed so ordinary. And I heard so many, this story so many times, I assumed I was there. And I would have gone on, I would have gone on the stand and sworn to that. So it just shows you that, that you know, memories can be altered, they can be implanted, uh, they can be false, and you will be absolutely convinced that these things happened. Um, and there have been um, experiments, there was, um, do, there was a researcher named Dr. Elizabeth Loftus who did um, a study with adults, uh, called, I think they were college-age kids, um, and talked to their parents and asked the parents, uh, give me three incidents that happened to your child that they would remember. And the parents would give three, hopefully, traumatic incidents that these kids would remember. And Dr. Loftus typed them up, and she added a fourth fictional incident that never happened. And gave these four incidents to the subjects and said, we want you to think back to your childhood and describe what you remember from these four incidents. And after a couple of weeks of trying to come up with a description of what happened, they actually believed that fourth fictional incident happened in their lives. And they were able to describe it in great detail, down to smells, down to clothing, down to things um, that they remembered about something that never happened. So that was the imp implantation of a false memory. And that, that whole fascinating psychological um, you know, theme uh, is part of my story as well. So I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now, and then I want to open up to questions, because I hope you have some good questions for me. Um, right now, I'm working on um, a non-Brazilian Isle story. It's a, um, if you ever remember that movie, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, yeah. uh, yes. maybe the TV show you remember were told me. OK, well, I'm working on a story that's about a troubled young, a troubled woman who rents the sea captain's house in Maine. And the sea captain is still there. Um, and they fall in love. They fall in love. And except that she starts to hear stories about women who have died in this house before her. And she begins to wonder whether she's fallen in love with a ghost or a demon. Um, and that's, that's kind of the thriller of it, you know. Is, um, is it, a, is, it, is it a ghost who she can trust, or is it something much darker and much more dangerous? Um, and then my son and I are working on a um, working on a feature documentary film now, looking into the centuries-long history of the relationship between humans and pigs. Uh, everyone goes, huh? Oh, pigs. Um, but no, it's it's really fascinating. We want to we want to track down the mystery of why Jews and Muslims don't eat pork. Is there a reason beyond? what religious scholars tell us. Is there something else that happened between 3,000 um, years ago and 2,000 years ago? Because they were eating pork in Israel 3,000 years ago. And then by 2,000 years ago, they'd stopped. So something happened in that 1,000-year uh, span. Um, and that's the mystery we're tracking down. We're talking to archaeologists. We're talking to climate change scientists. Because it turns out that there was a massive climate change in that region about then. Um, and we're also talking to geneticists who told us that at the time the pigs went out of favor, the chickens were introduced. Um, so it's anyway, this, there's a lot of fascinating stuff that we're, uh, we're looking into. So um, I will open it up to questions if anybody has anything. Oh, you're also silent. Yes, sir. Thomas Jefferson, can you describe your writing uh, habits or routines at two points in your life now? And when you were still practicing medicine, mm -hmm. uh, presumably with zero time. Yes. Yeah. Well, when I started, well, um, I, I actually wanted to, I wanted to be a writer when I was seven years old. Um, but my, my very conservative Chinese American father said that's no way to make a living. So um, I, he's and urged me to go into the sciences, so I became a doctor. And I, um, but I continued to write stories. Um, and, and it was only when I went on maternity leave that I really got the chance to write my first novel. Um, the real difference, I think, um, between then and now, was that back then I would write in snatches. You know, you write when your kid's asleep. You write when your kid's napping. You write when the school bus finally takes them away. Um, and so you learn to write very concentrated and, 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 and as much as you can. But even then, if you only wrote, wrote one page a day, by the end of a year, you could have a first draft of a book. So um, even with a busy, a busy schedule, it's possible to, to write a book. Now that I, I don't have any distractions, I sit at home and there's nobody to bother me, 
I write much more slowly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really true. You know, it's a, you know your, your work expands to fill but however much time you have. I think the big difference I have now is that I've learned to trust my, my process. Um, and the mistakes I made early on, and it's probably the same mistakes that a lot of first-time or, or new authors make, is that they, they get started, they get really excited about a, a book idea, they start to write, and halfway through, they get bored. And they think, oh, I've got a better idea now. We put that, that half a manuscript aside, and they end up with ten half manuscripts. Um, I have learned to get through that, that middle, that section where you just hate your book. Um, and I've learned to accept that the first draft is always bad. So you, you just give yourself permission to, to write badly, and that's what I do now. And that's how I, I power through until the end of the first draft. Um, and no, no matter how bad it is, I know I can always fix it. Yes, sir. How long were you a doctor? Do you miss it all? I was. A, I um, I worked as a as an internal medicine doctor for about um, eight years, um, but a lot of that was part time because I was always off. I also had two young kids, and I you know I love what I'm doing so much now that I don't really miss medicine. I, what I miss is 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 the chance to meet people and and to talk. the great thing about being a doctor. It's like something nice about being a cop, although being a doctor is a little easier. Um, and that is you get to meet people from all walks of life. You're not, you're not focused on like one socioeconomic strata. You, you are seeing people that come in from the streets, and you're seeing people that are bankers. So um, it is, it's a real good view of humanity. Yes? How did the Rizzoli and I come about? The okay. Well, um, it was about book four uh, when I got a call from a, a producer. And he said, I love your girls, and I think they belong on TV. Now, I had sold options or outright um, movie sales before, and nothing ever happened. So uh, my philosophy when Hollywood calls is just, check, just cash the check and walk away and forget about it, <laughs> um, because nothing ever happens. So yeah, his check was good, and I forgot about it. And a year later, he said, we have a great script, and we have cast the part of Jane Rizzoli. Now, if you've read the books, you know that Jane Rizzoli is not attractive. She's kind of an ordinary, frizzy-haired uh, woman who um, is uh, kind of always jealous of the beautiful woman in, in the room. And they said, we've cast um, Angie Harmon in the part. <laughs> um, which was, I mean, I, I kind of, I like the idea of an ordinary woman. I thought that we can all identify with the Jane of the books, but how can you turn down Angie Harmon? It's just absolutely fantastically beautiful. Plus, she also had the right attitude. I think she, I think she, she said to me once that she was born to play Jane Rizzoli. So um, she was, she was uh, very well cast, even though she's not glamorous. <laughs> um, and then Maura Isles was, um, you know, they, after, they, they cast Sasha after, after already having cast Angie, um, and they just brought in an actress to read against Angie and found that 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 screen chemistry was very strong. So that was how they, uh, why they hired Sasha Alexander. So that's, that's what happened. It went on for seven seasons. I, I did not um, have anything to do with writing the series. Uh, they have their own team of writers. They based the pilot episode on my book, The Apprentice. And one of the episodes was based on my short story, John Doe. Um, but everything else was, was their original work. Um, but anyway, uh, after seven seasons, it went out number one. It was the top rated show on TNT. Did you kind of wish that they had, it, it had more of your book into it? So? You know, writers always do. <laughs> they always think that uh, the original is better. Um, but uh, they did a couple things that were very smart. Um, first of all, they made sure that, they, that the focus was totally on the female friendship. And that was one thing the producer told me. He said, um, these two characters will never get married on the, on the series, um, because we want everybody to realize it's about female buddies. It's about two women, and, we're, and the men will just be a distraction. So <laughs> it was all about, and he said they hadn't had a show like that since Cagney and Lacey, and they were looking for something like that. So, um, And the other thing they did, which was very smart, was they put a lot of humor into it. Um, luckily, the showrunner was a funny, it was wickedly funny woman, and I think that, that helped a lot as well. Yes? Once you have come up with your idea of what the book is going to be about, you know, you, you see it portrayed on TV or whatever, this writer's block. How do you get started with the first first sentence? 
You know, the first sentence is really important. And you'd be amazed how sometimes a good first sentence will get you going. Um, the way I do it is I have to hear a voice. I have to hear a character's voice talking to me, and that really helps. Um, if you read um, the book Vanish, which is about the woman who wakes up in the body bag, um, I remember I struggled to how, to how to start that book, and all of a sudden, this young woman's voice came to me, and, and the first sentence she said was, my name is Mila, and this is my journey. And then it was like the rest of that chapter wrote itself. Now, I don't plot my books out ahead of time. I just start off with that voice talking to me, that character who's so strong, and um, who powerfully moves that first um, chapter. And at the end of that chapter, I think, well, what happens next? Um, so in a way, it's like one chapter builds on another chapter. I've tried, I've tried outlining my books ahead of time, and I always end up throwing the outlines away because I get bored. Um, now, what this means is that my first drafts are all, I don't know what happened, so I go through a lot of loose, um, I, go, I go through a lot of blind alleys, and, and I, I get stuck. And I always have writer's block, because halfway through, I think, I have no idea what happens next. Um, and as an example, I'll go back to this book, Vanish, about the corpse that wakes up in the morgue. I started off that first draft, and the corpse in the body bag was a man. That was my first idea. It was a man in the body bag, and he shoots the security guard, and he takes hostages, and he's in control of Jane Mazzoli. And, and, um, and it, so it's a hostage crisis. And I'm halfway through the book, and it should be exciting, right? It should be exciting. And I'm so terribly bored, I don't know what happens next. I don't know why. He killed the guard. I don't know why he's taken hostages. I don't know why he was in the body bag. I don't know why if he's a good guy or a bad guy. So um, I do what I normally do in this case. I put the book aside for a couple of weeks. Um, and what I think helps writer's block, and, and other writers will tell you this, hot baths, <laughs> long walks, or for me, boring drives. I, I take a long, boring drive where you don't really, you know, your brain is kind of like in this, in this, um, self-drive thing where you're not really thinking about the drive because it's so easy, it's a nice straight, um, straight road. And it allows your brain to kind of relax and work on something without the stress of thinking, I've got to finish this book. So I was in Texas. I, I had to, it was a four hour drive through West Texas. Boy, that is a big stage. <laughs> and somewhere there I thought, oh, I think I know what my problem is with Vanish. I know why I'm bored. I'm bored because it's a man who's doing all these things. I mean, think about it. Who takes hostages in this world? Who kills people with guns? It's almost always men. Um, and that's why it was boring to me, because it's just like, this is real life. This is boring. But what if it was a woman who did those things? That's really weird. A woman who kills a guard and takes hostages. What is her deal? So I thought, now this become fascinating. And I went home. And I didn't bother to go back and finish the first half, uh, to redo the first half of the book. I just kept going from that middle of that story until the end as if it had always been a woman in a body bag. And then I was able to figure out the rest of the story. But, I mean, you can see the problems of looking at that first draft if you've never, if you've never, don't know anything about it, where the character suddenly turns from a man to a woman midway through the story. Um, but that my, you know, my philosophy is that I should never stop to edit anything in that first draft. Because once you start to edit, you can stay there and edit that first chapter for the next 10 years of your life. You always want, you want it to be perfect and you never get past it. So really, you need to be up to allow yourself to write badly. And that's, that's the only thing. Well, the only other thing I do that's peculiar that people go, what? I, I write my first drafts, not on a keyboard. I can type 100 words a minute, but I don't write the first draft on a keyboard. I write it with a pen and unlined typing paper. Um, and I think it goes back to childhood, how, how you know, we learned how to write with the pen. It's like the immediate neurologic connection between our brain. Um, and I love unlined typing paper because you don't have those lines to get in your way. And you can write big or small or sideways, and it just feels like playing again. So if you get writer's block, sometimes it helps just to get out a pen and paper. Yeah. I got to do share writing through the Rizzoli and Isles television series. Mm -hmm. I knew they had to be more of these characters than what I was seeing on the television. So thank you very much. I fell in love with the, with the friendship that you wanted they had. Did your father see your success? No, unfortunately. My father got Alzheimer's before he saw my success. My mother did that. My mother lived long enough to see my success. And my mother, I told you about her love of horror films. She always had one comment after reading every one of my books. And her comment was, it could be scarier. <laughs>
being dug up. The body and, and oh, that might be the key to the head. The, yeah, they, they were the shrunken heads. Yes. Yeah. How did you come up with that? <laughs> that was the one that had to do. It started out with the, it was there was a mummy, there was a bog body, and there was a shrunken head. Okay, um, I, you know this, that's my archaeology love again, and, and shrunken that heads. That freaked me out. Shrunken, <laughs> shrunken heads are really fascinating because I thought, how did you do that? And I was able to find out, you know, it, it, it's it's this, this this tribe down in South America, and it has to do with their religion. They feel that if they if they kill somebody and, and shrink the head, they, they absorb this, this spiritual power. It makes them powerful as, as, you know, in many ways. And the way they do it, they can, they can shrink a head in three days. Um, and one, of course, after the decapitation, the first thing they have to do is get rid of the skull. So they make an incision, and um, the incision pretty much is a, like a flap, and they, they, just, they just peel. And if you've ever, well, I know you've probably never seen an autopsy. <laughs> In the autopsy room, actually, the, the, the skull can be peeled right off that skull. Um, and so they just peel it off the skull, they throw off the skull. And so they have this, this, this kind of a rubber mask kind of thing. And um, they fill it with hot sand and hot stones, and they smoke it over a fire. And of course, it starts to shrink like leather. It's a little bit like tanning leather, and it does shrink down. Um, so uh, that, that whole thing was so fascinating because I had to put it in a book because I know you wanted to know about it. <laughs> yes? Uh, my favorite of my books? You know, it's funny, the, and most writers will tell you the books that they love the most that they've written are the ones that probably sold the fewest copies. Um, no, but I, I think the books that I love the most are the books that presented the biggest challenge to me to write. And one of them was a book called Gravity which um, was about NASA, it was about the International Space Station. Um, and that was a book I wrote in 1999, and it required so much incredible research. It took me um, over two years to write that story. Um, and it involved a lot of work with NASA. Um, and I remember approaching that story and thinking, um, my goal is to write a book about the space program that no aerospace engineer can find anything wrong with. And that was really tough because I was working with um, I got a lot of technological detail, um, and luckily I was able to get NASA's help. Um, so that was that was the one that when I wrote that book I thought I'll never be able to do this right. Um, but after that book was published, I remember getting a getting a call from somebody from Texas. I, I heard the Texas accent because I work at NASA. And I just read your book Gravity, and I just want to tell you you got something wrong. I said, What did I get wrong? He said. Your character in this chapter drives into the building 30 parking lot and parks his car. And I said, yeah. And he goes, I've worked here for 20 years and there's never been an empty space in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm doing my job. Um, and, um, and the other book I loved um, was The Bone Garden. And that was a book that was set in 1830. And it was about Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes and, um, and uh, a, an outbreak of childbed fever. At the same time, there is a serial killer at work in Boston. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, okay. So you mentioned that you tear up um, articles or mm -hmm. magazine pieces, but you also reflect on a lot of stories and things that you've heard. So how do you document that to go back to to inspire you, because I know my memory isn't that great. Well, that's what the folder is for. <laughs> you know, I just I just have stuff that piles up in there. And, I, and as I said, sometimes I don't know when I'm going to use it. Okay, but a lot of creativity has to do with taking, I call it one plus one equals four, where you find this little detail and this little detail, and you put them together, and bam, you've got this, this chemical reaction that's bigger than the two of those things. And the example I can think of is um, years ago, I think it was in the 90s, I read about an incident called the Dugway Sheep Incident. And this happened in Skull Valley, Utah. I'm not making this up. Um, and it's about, the, the story was this farmer, it was March, it was cold, the farmer in this valley came out, um, he, was, he was working and he got a headache and he went inside to go to bed early. And the next morning he came out and he found his yard littered with dead birds and dead rodents and stuff. What's going on? Um, and throughout that day, farmers went out to check their, their flocks of sheep. 
and the sheep were all dead. 3,000 sheep died overnight in this valley. It was a mystery, and it was a mystery that nobody could solve until about 30 years went by, and, and the, US, uh, <clears throat> the U.S. declassified the file. It was an Air Force experiment with nerve gas. Oh. And uh, the wind had come in an unexpected direction and gone through this valley and killed everything in that valley. Um, and, I, and I thought, when I read that, I thought, oh my God, what if it had been summertime and everybody's windows had been open? They could have killed a whole town. What would have happened then? But I didn't know what the story was, and I didn't know how my characters would be involved. So I put that aside, and decades later, um, what got it back to my mind was um, I had a GPS incident. I followed my, G my, my GPS voice, what's her name, <laughs> um, into a cornfield. I was, I was trying to find a bed and breakfast, and she sent me through a cornfield. And, but there were other tire tracks to the cornfield, so I just followed the tire tracks. And, and, and I got to the bed and breakfast at the end, and I get there, and the, and the, uh, the guy who runs the B&B the &B says, so did you come to the cornfield too? <laughs> and it turned out that there was a, there was a problem with the, 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 the glitch. There was a glitch somewhere in that, in that GPS program, and everybody got to his B&B in the cornfield. So, but then I began to think, oh, gee, you know, it could have been a lot worse. How many, how, you know, we all know about horror stories with GPSs, and I began to collect those stories. And there were a couple of deaths. Uh, there was a case of somebody from Oregon, uh, from going, coming from Oregon to California, followed his GPS down a seasonal road in the wintertime, didn't realize it was a seasonal road. And um, the car got stuck, and he died because he got out to try and hike to um, civilization and was killed by a bear. Um, so um, suddenly I thought, oh my god, GPS accident, nerve gas accident. Um, and that turned into a book called Ice Cold, where Maura Isles um, is on a ski trip with her friends in Wyoming. They follow their GPS down the seasonal road and end up getting stuck in the snow. And they hike to the nearest town, and the nearest town, the nearest village is like this little community of houses where um, there are no people. But dinner is on every table, as if they were about to sit down for dinner. So she has this mystery. Um, not only is she stranded in this little village, she's wondering where the people went and why there are dead pets everywhere. Mm -hmm. so, um, and so that was a combination of, um, I just needed this, that one little element to make, to make the story come together. Wow, fine. So thank you. OK, I have one more question. Um, you hear all these uh, stories. I just cited one of them, Grisham. Mm -hmm. uh, rejected 90 times on mm -hmm. the time to kill. And then occasionally you hear a story about someone who the first time out they just get like, um, what would your experience? I wrote two un, uh, unsold manuscripts. Um, you know, a lot of it is that you learn as you're as you're writing, you learn you learn to write better or you learn what the what people are looking for. And a lot of it is timing. Timing and luck. You know, there's so much luck involved in publishing. So thank you very much and I'll be happy to start.